Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As sinful people, there are a lot of things that we struggle with. Some of them are easy to recognize, others not so much. What is especially difficult is when we are confronted with the hard truth that there are certain things, certain ideas and behaviors that we just think are right, but they're not. And we really can't stand to hear that they're not. When we are told that there are things that we say and believe and, and do which are bad, but in our minds we just say to ourselves, well, these things really aren't that bad at all. A lot of times a conflict will ensue within our very soul. Sometimes there is an immediate desire to lash out at those who have spoken against the sinful desires and behaviors that we have befriended. It's a kind of visceral reaction that you can feel welling up inside of you and then overflows in angry words and actions. At other times, when we are confronted, there may not be an immediate desire to get even, but, but rather the long march of facts and data to show that we are right. We want to win and to have the final say. So we set out to prove that our ideas and behaviors which have been called into question are in fact justified. Still, others might try to transfer their guilt to someone else by questioning them in what they have said or by simply blaming them instead of taking responsibility for false words and deeds of their own. But whatever we do, as long as we evade the truth, we will be no better off. In many ways, these typical responses to being convicted are encapsulated in the words and deeds of the priests and the Levites in our gospel lesson. You see, they go out to speak with John because they've heard about his message. They know that he has been exhorting people to repent in preparation for the entrance of God's kingdom into the world. And I imagine it probably didn't take too long for John's rebuke of the Pharisees and the Sadducees as a brood of vipers to spread among the whole region where he was proclaiming this truth. So they go out to the Jordan because they are scandalized by John's preaching. And they want to know who he thinks he is and how it is that he can say such things. There has not been a true prophet of God in over 400 years. And all of a sudden, this upstart, camel hair wearing, locust eating prophet, condemns people who by all popular accounts were the most righteous in all of Israel at the time. And so there, there it is. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they send out the priests and the Levites because they cannot imagine the need to repent for the coming kingdom of God. To them, when they look at themselves, they seem to be just fine. In fact, they don't just look fine. In their own eyes, they look righteous, as if they are the true children of Abraham and the inheritors of God's kingdom. So they go to John and they ask him, who are you? They want to know if he is the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah, because John's words are mighty convicting. And in their minds, it's going to take an awful lot, some serious authority for them to be accepted. John says he's not the Christ. He is not the promised Redeemer who will come to save sinful people from their transgression. Others then ask, well, what then? Are you Elisha? It was well known that the prophet Malachi had foretold that Elisha would return prepare the way of the Lord before the coming of the Christ. But this too, John does not acknowledge. Because while John is in fact the prophetic voice of one crying in the wilderness, in the same spirit of Elijah, he is not the physical manifestation of Elijah somehow come down from heaven as the priests and the Levites apparently were expecting. Finally, someone else asks if he is the prophet foretold by Moses in Deuteronomy 18, which is our Old Testament lesson for today. Because Moses had said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me among you from your brothers. It is to him that you shall listen. Once more, 
John refuses to claim this title as his own because it's actually speaking about the Messiah, and not the forerunner. So at that point, John kind of gets control of the situation, and in order to clear up all this confusion, he says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah has said. John is the forerunner of the Christ. And he is the one foretold by Isaiah who would come first to prepare the way of the Lord. And that is exactly what he is doing by proclaiming repentance in preparation for the coming kingdom of heaven. But the truth of John's message isn't something that the sinful Pharisees and priests and Sadducees and Levites want to hear. Because John's message is one of their own woeful inadequacy. It is one that says they do not deserve the kingdom of God. They are not a righteous people. And if they try to climb their way into heaven, they're just going to fall to their death. That's a painful truth pointed out by God's forerunner. And they're not happy about it. In fact, they're downright angry because they think they know better than John. What's even worse for them is that the message of the Christ, in many ways, okay, under the conviction of the law, is going to be very well aligned with John's. In fact, not only is it going to be aligned with John's, it's going to far surpass it. What I mean to say is that as convicting as John's teaching is about the law of God, Jesus is, just go is going to be just as strong and even really surpass it because Jesus isn't going to come simply pointing to someone else. When Jesus comes, all of heaven is going to come with him. Because with the coming of the Christ comes God himself. And Jesus has some very strong words for those who had heard and rejected John. And he has some very strong words for us sinful people too. He has come to teach with the greatest authority that we deserve to be rejected by God. Because what we do according to the flesh and, and what we think is good isn't really good at all. What greatness we attribute to ourselves, our Lord holds in derision. For just like the Pharisees and the priests and the Levites, we estimate ourselves of far greater worth and value in this world than our Lord does because of our sin. And just like the detractors of John, how they once argued with him, so do we argue with our fellow men when we are held in the wrong. And likewise, do we try to justify ourselves when we are guilty before God? And I know we're all Lutherans. We know we're not justified by our works. But the fact is, we are sinful people. And we try to do these very things. And if we deny it, our denial is simply proof. Our Lord knows our nature, which is why he speaks so forcefully against it. It is why he has sent the likes of John the Baptist into the world, calling us to repentance. And it's why Jesus does the same. We need to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it doesn't belong to us sinful people, no matter what we may think. It belongs to the Christ who in days of old was declared to be the Lord, our righteousness. It is Jesus, and he alone, who has no just judgment or conviction brought against him. He is righteous and holy, without spot or blemish. And he is so far above us poor sinners that not even the greatest of God's prophets in the Old Testament era is worthy to untie the strap of his sandal. That is how far the greatness of God as Savior is above the fictitious great greatness that we see in ourselves. And yet this righteous life, this life lived by Christ according to the revealed will of God, it is not kept as the Savior's own possession. It is merited that it might be bestowed. We may not have a righteous life to give our God, just like those who come to speak against John. But it does not mean that a righteous life is beyond 
our possession. It is quite within reach, as long as it is God's arms that stretch it out to us. This is why John says that he baptizes with water. But one is coming after him who will baptize with something that is far greater. He is going to baptize with water mixed with the very promises of God. Promises that declare to sinful people that when they are engrafted into the Christ, his righteous life will become theirs. See, the priests and the Levites may be frustrated, much like us, when we hear the truth of sin. But how sweet is it, how truly sweet is it to hear the good news that by the very mercy of God, the Christ is coming into the world to rescue us from all of our sins and our guilt. And he will do it without any help from us at all. In fact, God doesn't want our help when it comes to securing our salvation. Because he doesn't want our works to be confused with his. He wants the works of Christ to stand alone. So our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has determined by his love and his mercy to take upon himself all our sins all our guilt. And from the time when he stepped down into those waters of the Jordan, when John first prepared his way, he has indeed and in truth carried our sins to the cross so that he might make atonement for every single one of them. And thanks be to God that he has. And that the forgiveness of our sins and the redemption that he has brought to completion in his own death for our sake is now extended to us as we are baptized into his kingdom. We evil people who think that we are so good and just and right have in this simple and yet most profound gift received the hope of all mankind. We baptized people are the heirs of the kingdom of heaven because like all those who have been baptized, we have received the one coming after the forerunner whose power and greatness exceeds anything else the world will ever know because the power and the greatness of the only begotten Son of God washes away all our sin and all our guilt. And it brings the gift of eternal life without one single contribution on our part. Thanks be to God for such grace and mercy given to us. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.